to you wherever you are in the world thank you for being here i hope that you're healthy and secure namo myoho renge kyo um i don't know why i'm compelled to say this but in the last video some of you may have if you were watching seen my beads disintegrating <laughs> as i was uh talking and uh I'm going, I have to restring them. I've had them for a while. And uh, finally, the string wore out on a particular part. I have to be more cautious about how I put them together. Um, but they're, they're coming back. Don't worry. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I have these lovely, this lovely set of ceremonial beads uh, that I wear from time to time. And certainly when I perform ceremonies on uh, Nichiren's birthday, Shakyamuni's, birthday or a uh, day of enlightenment, several, you know, and memorials, uh, the passing uh, or extinction of Nichiren and other important dates um, that I do ceremonies for. And certainly when I do memorial ceremonies for uh, the deceased, particular people um, for which I do a special gongyo. You can read all about that kind of stuff in Big Book of Buddhism. Um, but today, we're going to continue. Um, I think I probably have one more video after this because I doubt we'll complete the, the entire Angi Kuden today. Um, so I think it's going to take an additional video. But... Um, I think we're getting to understand the nature of this document as we take our time reading through it. And, uh, you know, that's a big part of why I started this channel is to uh, get rid of rumors, misinformation, um, the mysticism, right, that follows our study, our endeavor of uh, Buddhist practice or Buddhism. Um and I quite like uh, the insight we're getting here from reading not only the Angekuden, but the Anko Kikigaki. Uh, I think that the, uh, the two documents in one way couldn't be more different. And at the same time, both seek in their own way to... Um, not only learn from Nietzsche's lectures from an intimate perspective, but from an, should I say, advanced perspective? Or what do I mean? A, um, a perspective of um, a great amount of alliteration in Buddhism that we, uh, we certainly can read and study somewhat compressed, compressed like you're in an advanced program in school where a lot of, uh, there's an assumed base of knowledge. Um, and I think that that's important because all of us have faced uh, at multiple points in our practice, how in the heck do I tell somebody about this? Because the, the centerpiece of our practice is bodhisattva, right? Coursing in the world as someone who has awakened. And as difficult as it is to keep that state of mind active 24-7, 
like Nitrin would say in his Go Show, I, I live Myohorengekyo all day long now. Namo Myohorengekyo in every moment of the day. Uh, that's a position of existence in this samsaric physical realm that is, or certainly we can appreciate, can be quite amazing, quite shifting in perspective, right? Which is what our practice is about. Um, we do well to achieve it in the moments we're in front of our mandala chanting sincerely, single-mindedly to awaken that Buddha consciousness, right? To carry that throughout the day, well, as one might say, uh, to do so in seclusion has a much greater intimacy possibility because of the lack of distractions to maintain that place of mind of perception but if you're like most of the world you're having to enter a stream of samsara of intense attachment and physicality to money rent relationships jobs the economy there's just a, the the endless plethora or plethora, however you choose to pronounce it, of just the mire of attachment, of thingness, of emotions, right? It's very hard to keep that Buddha-ness front and center with so many things tugging at your attention, right? You could say in a way that what Buddha called the monkey mind of constant distractions takes physical forms in innumerable ways in our daily lives. So what does that mean? What it means is it makes this practice all the more difficult to stay in Myoho Renge Kyo. It's not an easy thing. Which is why our daimoku and our recitations are so important. So that we can take that entire day of experience of thingifying and attachments and reason them out with our Buddha mind. Before we go to sleep at night, let us dream about converting everything into enlightenment rather than struggle and stress and anxiety while we sleep. <laughs> and then, after we've gone through that entire night time of reevaluation, albeit in a different form, a different dream, <laughs> when we awake in the morning, we want to make sure we have our maximal energy, alignment, clarity foot forward as we uh, move into another day of challenges. In this way, our life continues to expand uh, and understand and observe the incredible, unfathomably huge amount of manifestations of life. Call it life, call it energy, call it formations, call it karma. It's truly unfathomable, just as the universe is unfathomable. We just put uh, recently the James Webb Telescope into uh, uh, the Grangian Point 2 uh, orbit in the uh, in outer space outer as refers to the earth certainly and uh, it's going to give us it's a time machine it's going to give us images from further away than we've ever been able to see 
into the past of this universe. And still we won't see the entirety. Amazing creatures, aren't we? Amazing creatures because of the myriad, incalculable, numerous amalgams of energy that manifest us. Right? And I was thinking about this last night, self-manifestation. I've often gotten questioned, what does that really mean, self-manifestation? Um, and I was thinking, you know, there's not just a singular answer to that. Um, because on the one hand, samsarically, in the physical universe, we are, as I've said many times now, constructed. We are put together of stuff that is put together, that is put together, that is put together, that is put together of ultimately the same energy that created this vast universe. And the formations from that energy that eventually, after billions of years, a, a time period we can't really comprehend, produces human beings, and not just human beings, but a type of organism, a type of apparatus of not just us, but the environment of us, Think for a moment on that right there. This is a central concept of Buddhism, isn't it? That our environment and our minds are one. Think of a fish in, a, in, a, in your aquarium, if you have an aquarium at home with a fish in it. If the aquarium, the body of water that you have, doesn't have fish in it, then it doesn't have fish in it. It's just water. If you put in your glass container fish without water, you won't have fish for long. So there's a prerequisite to have fish live. They need an environment, in this case, water. You and I are no different. We just don't get it. It's not immediately obvious to our samsaric mind that the clinging and craving and attachment we have for everything around us is a, is a perfectly reasonable effect of being instantiated, manifest as a human being. Because without this outer realm that supports our being here, literally, we would not exist. Just take, for instance, all of the other planets we've looked at, wondering if life could exist there. Let aside the fact that the planets themselves are an example of life, the same process. The conditions, however, of particular formations don't support beings like us, let alone the intensely specific instance and conditions that support life as you and I, that this particular assemblage, amalgam of conditions and tendencies that result in you and I are the conditions necessary to emerge a mind that considers this very question. There's no atom or organ that we can point to and go, there's mind. We can point to a brain, an amazing database and processor, but mind is not the brain. Mind is an emergent property of the brain and it, nothing can emerge from the brain if the brain doesn't have an apparatus to support it. And it, you and I, 
this apparatus can't exist without all of the incalculable conditions and tendencies that came together to produce life in this particular form, on this particular planet, in this particular solar system, in this particular galaxy, in this particular universe. It's mind-blowing stuff when you start to break it down that way, right? Self and environment really necessarily are coexistent, codependent, co really the same thing. So our condition of mind allows us to perceive the situation as nerve wracking, suspicious confident, all of our different relationships with our environment are really a systemic truth about our own tendencies and conditions. Make sense? So if we can open our minds to the bigger picture of how all of it is functioning, suddenly we're not as tense anymore. Because the differences matter a whole lot less. Because the fundamental connection of everything kind of a relief. Oh, I don't have to worry about what's that, what am I doing to that and what that is doing to me. Because we're in the same soup. We're in the same process, changing constantly. So when we look back to these documents, bet you wondered how I was going to do that. <laughs> Both these documents, whether they're like the Uncle Kikigaki, which is a direct notation, an experience by one of the six senior monks of actual lectures from Nichiren that he and the other monks were participating in as Nichiren was getting ready to pass away his extinction or whether you read the Anki uh, the Anki Kudin which is some senior monk some monk in the lineage of a different school the Fuji school reading and reviewing a document made by a senior monk n making notations and impressions on his experience of lectures from Nichiren. What we end up with are two documents that conceptualize the scholarship of Nichiren and the Lotus Sutra, and therefore Shakyamuni, in a much more condensed fashion, looking at specific phrases of the Lotus Sutra and extrapolating from the words, the Anki, the, uh, the um, Anki Kudin, far more word hungry, word, word fetishized but for the same purpose looking at the different varied concepts within the entire scholarship of Buddhism and certainly Nichiren's doctrine but don't lose the bigger picture because that's what it's about regarding how to connect the dots when I'm assisting somebody in their life struggle toward Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, toward this practice of Lotus Sutra Buddhism. How can I, in a position to assist Bodhisattva, relate these teachings, these many teachings, 
to their personal experience, their life. And so it's helpful that you can take the same sentence, the same teaching, the same concept and bring connectivity to it from different points of view. From di and after all, isn't that the entire scholarship of Shakyamuni? Teaching to the people's capacity. This population, this culture, in this area of India think and, and have lived culturally with these normative thoughts. How can I reach into those normative thoughts and shift them, persuade them to learn a deeper concept about how they got to those structures of thought vis-a-vis -vis working toward enlightenment? How can I take somebody who's adamantly convinced that there are these particular truths in their lives and slowly, gently take those same truths and make them self-obviate that they're not truths, that they're constructs, and that by understanding their construction, they can then be liberated from those hard and fast ideas and move, therefore, toward a much more precise, a much more true aspect of their life. Move them from feeling like they're just victims of life, where everything is impinged upon them, to a self-actualized life, where they understand that whatever their starting point they need to construct and deconstruct those systems of being to a point where they feel powerful, empowered, insightful enough to alter the patterns in their life, the patterns they've accepted versus the patterns they can redirect and construct a much more secure an enjoyable life. I, this is the entire impetus of Buddhism. So these documents, these two, though from very different points of view, depending on the author of the documents, whom we're pretty sure of one, but not at all sure of the other, are still trying to do the same thing. They're trying to look at the corpus of the teachings and derive from different perspectives, just like different sutras, how I can relate this as a bodhisattva, as an assistant, as a participant in life to those in my environment because water fish, they too are me and I am them. How can I inspire them, bring relief to them, de-stress them and give them the power to do that for themselves. Because I can't lay hands on somebody and have them experience awakening. They must do it for themselves. Why? Because it's their mind that's constructing the whole thing. You ever try to change somebody's mind? Has that ever worked? The only time it works is if you give them enough instruction and support, more importantly, that they come to the conclusions on their own. And every time that happens, their conclusions and the way they derive them will surprise you. Because their insights and their experience of the very same life you're experiencing are different. They're unique. And in that, we realize even more to our astonishment how wide, how broad the breadth of enlightenment, awakening, Buddha-ness really is.
This is why the Bodhisattva path is so superior. It is the path of full, complete, and perfect enlightenment. All right. Is he ever going to get to the <laughs> document? Yes, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> I hope you guys don't mind me laughing at myself. I'm not laughing at you. Please know that, first of all. I just... This communication thing. It's, it's sometimes tragic. It's sometimes ecstatic. But... It's such a strange way to communicate. <laughs> okay, 23. The remotest past, quote unquote. That's a three word sentence we're quoting here. And here we go. We're going to take that apart. The Angi Kudin states The meaning of this fathoming the lifespan chapter lies in the Buddha's actual attainment of enlightenment in the remotest past. Kwan Jitsu Jo. There's this constant slippery slope in English translations here, and I don't know how prevalent it is in the original languages it was transcribed into, but it's kind of an oxymoron. Think of the structure of the sentence I just read, not the remotest past, but this sentence that says the meaning of this fathoming the lifespan of the Tathagata chapter lies in the Buddha's actual attainment of enlightenment. Well, the Buddha doesn't attain enlightenment ever. Why? Because Buddha is enlightenment. So in this case, it should say Shakyamuni Buddha, should it not? After all, that is the entire mind-blowing drop-the-mic moment of the lifespan of the Tathagata chapter. The lifespan of the Tathagata, not Shakyamuni, the lifespan of the Tathagata is the nature of Buddha. Buddha being the original cause and effect, the original enlightenment inherent I wouldn't even say the original enlightenment let me correct that enlightenment is understanding that it is the original formative forces behind the formations of everything life this universe you and I grass trees dogs we all have this origin in common. Understanding that that is not only the starting point, but constantly happening moment to moment to moment to moment to moment in everything, including ourselves. That is awakening to that truth. And that awakening allows us to break our dependence, our, our, our hooks of identity from thingness and see ourselves mentally as a cognitive, conscious being in this flow of life along with everything. There is no separation. That's awakening. So, the actual attainment of enlightenment is not something the Buddha does because that's what the Buddha is. But the question at hand in this chapter is Shakyamuni's awakening and enlightenment. And so Shakyamuni constantly in the sutras plays this game of, yeah, I'm a man here but I'm an awakened, enlightened man. The, the, the Buddha mind is how I course through this life. So he, by his very life, Shakyamuni, is the ultimate Bodhisattva. He is coursing through this 
human realm with the mind of Buddha, of clarity. So when he lives every moment, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, as a physical human being, with a mind, a thought moment, which where can thought happen? Only in this universe. It can't happen without this apparatus because thought is a, an emergent property of mind. So while alive as a human being, we have these thought moments which are emergent from our physical instantiation, manifestation, human moment, 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 moment. And every one of his moments are with this clarity of Buddha. And so he's a very effective communicator and storyteller and teacher, our maximal facilitator of something he's achieved, which has never been achieved before. And so in the lifespan of the Tathagata chapter of the Lotus Sutra, he's letting all of those people know, hey, this isn't unique. This isn't me that achieved this. Yes, I've achieved Buddhahood. But what I've achieved, the nature of what my enlightenment is, is there for everyone and everything. Every mind can do this. Because it's been here from the very get-go, the very moment life began forming. This quality, this understanding, this truth of the formations of all forms has always been there, albeit not experienced until minds started to develop. Only through mind development can we then look. It's like, um, it's like footprints in snow. Uh, if you look at a fresh snowfall in the, in the bright morning sun outside, it's pristine and sparkly. And this is the nature of everything, right? An analogy. And then you spot depressions in the snow that go to somewhere and you understand, you dis discern that those are your footsteps from the previous day. Your footfalls in the snow creating depressions. But those footfalls in the snow are only perceivable by the mind that sees them, perceives them, and abstracts their creation, their ownership, until you develop a mind. And yes, even the mind of a creature, a coyote, rudimentary as it is, can perceive those footfalls. Do the footfalls exist? Of course they exist. Do the foot, does the snow exist? Does the glitter of the snow exist? That question can only exist by virtue of the mind that perceives it. Why do I say this? Because I think there's a tendency, you know the statement, out of sight, out of mind? But if it's out of mind, then it doesn't exist because the mind is the only thing that can perceive it. There's a denial built into that that says, sure, this, the, the universe, this planet's uh, 
This universe is 14 billion years old, or 13.9, depending on how accurate you want to get. So how can I, in 2022, be somehow connected to plasma? There weren't even planets or suns or particles for the first few moments of this universe, how am I connected to that? But you are. Because all of that is part of the equation, part of the construction that leads eventually to you and your emergent mind. They're not separate. The footfalls didn't happen in the snow without the snow pre-existing there, without weather, without precipitation, without certain temperatures, you start to take it apart, there's a lot that goes into that snowfall. The snow and the snowfall and that whole process didn't suddenly appear when you made footfalls in the ground. Does that make sense? Don't doubt your connection to the very primal forces that created everything. This is why we're all connected. This is why this is the oneness that you, the cliche you hear about Buddhism. It's about origins, shared existence in the process of life. So, This chapter, the meaning of this chapter, lies in the Buddha's actual attainment of enlightenment in the remote past. Okay, let's just move on from there. Remotest past, quote-unquote, has the meanings, multiple meanings, connecting a lot of the different teachings of Buddhism into one simple, digestible form. not setting in motion, quote-unquote, unadorned, and, quote, being just as it is originally, end quote. Now that's a little muddy, not setting in motion. Now I'm always telling you how we're all kinetic and momentum. But what, what I think this is trying to say, I think quite clearly, is that the realization, the Buddha mind, that we are all of the same energy in flow, in context of movement, is itself an unchanging thought. Think about that for a moment. Let's simplify it. Once you and your friends and maybe your college classroom, your professor, your culture decides that a color, a form of light reflection that we perceive with our eyes, we're going to call it or label it yellow. And so every single time anyone in your culture, in your place, looks and tries to describe the features, the characteristics of something in their environments or themselves, and they call it or label it yellow, whatever that spectrum is of yellowness, that definition, yellow, is unchanged. We all share it. We all know what it looks like. We all know what, it, for ourselves, individually, how we experience yellow. But we all know, in this word, communicating with one another, yellow. Oh, I got you, it's yellow. 
We all may get it slightly differently because we're all unique, but we have a spectrum and we all agree in that spectrum, we call that yellow. That's unchanging. I mean, that's a poor analogy because as we've always discussed, everything is constantly changing. But the perception, the qualification of yellowness broadly is unchanging. So this is what this statement is referring to, is that because it's originally inherent in everything, Buddha, this reality of all of these constantly transient formations, is an unchanging process. Though it's manifesting constant change, right? The process itself isn't changing. So that's an interesting perspective. Because this is the Buddha endowed with the uncreated three bodies, he does not attain enlightenment for the first time. This is not setting in motion. So again, this is taking apart the idea that Shakyamuni Buddha doesn't it invent, instantiate for the first time, discover for the first time, initiates Buddha. Buddha is actually a process or the perception of a process that has always been time without beginning, time without end, right? These kinds of statements. He is not endowed with the 32 marks or 80 characteristics. Thus, he is unadorned. He being the Buddha mind. And this, there's a lot of confusion because of this duality of language. And certainly in the translation, translations, because English is a very, um, it's a language of minutia. And you would think that would make it more accurate. But sometimes it confounds accuracy. And this, this is a language problem. Because he is the originally inherent Buddha who constantly abides, this is, quote, being just as it is originally, end quote. This is the meaning of remotest past, quote, unquote. Remotest past, quote, unquote, quan, indicates namu myoho renge kyo. Actual attainment, quote, unquote, means quote, truly opened, end quote, that is opened and revealed as being uncreated. So now we're being circular with words, trying to circumlocute this same idea that what we perceive with our Buddha mind, through enlightening our mind, by chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, we actually invoke the mind that perceives the equanimity of everything, the unchanging process of formations, formed, decay, and extinction. This is ongoing, moment to moment to moment to moment, in everything, all the time, always has been, albeit now, as humans, with an emergent mind, we can actually perceive it in our samsaric experience. That's what all of that is saying. Just walking around this concept. 27. The uncreated triple-bodied Buddha, his bija, august form, and samayas, end quote. The Angikudan states, The august form of this Buddha is the originally inherent forms and aspects of all living beings of the ten realms. What Shakyamuni Buddha has accomplished is no different from, no uniqueness from, or different from what all emergent minds can equally perceive. Your mind, my mind, your friend's mind, your mom's, your dad's, your brother's, your sister's, your neighbor's, 
your countrymen, your fellow humans, all with an emergent mind. Because we need, we, this is the one thing we need is a mind. Something that perceives the nature of things. And that true nature, not just to intellectually understand it, but to experience it, is Buddha. And that is the whole ball game in the Lotus Sutra, is by chanting, invoking it, single-mindedly bringing it forward with Myoho Renge Kyo, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, there it is, Buddha. It's not unique to Shakyamuni. This is a pre-existent reality from the moment of instantiation of the entire universe to its eventual cyclic transformation into starting over or, or blowing up whatever the universe is going to do. That's a different discussion. This process is ongoing and our minds are capable of experiencing what that means, how we live in that reality, bringing that insight into everything we experience. That is our way, our Buddha way of escaping, not running away from, of detaching our little tiny mental claws of identification with everything. Why? Because that is what causes stress, anxiety, suffering, so on and so forth. So if we're going to live a fulfilled life of deeper understanding how we can fulfill all of our potential, whatever that is, yours, mine, hers, his, we're all slightly different in the potentials we can manifest. We can observe that everything in the world is manifest from this same process. We can then work with abundance and joy choosing our maximal potential and helping our friends as example and as assistance to do the same. What a joyous world. This is the goal of Buddhism, equanimity, joy, by removing the very thing in samsara that causes us stress and anxiety. His samayas are what these beings of the ten realms hold. His bija is the single character for confidence, resolve, determination. That is namu myoho renge kyo, just as it is. Again, his samaya is the palms placed together in, as in chanting the Daimoku. Keep this secret. <laughs> Again, that exhortation, keep it secret. Not sure. I even wonder if that's the correct translation. But we understand what it means, right? We've already talked about this. The keep it secret basically just says, this is a really deep thought. And not everyone is ready to hear it or understand it. So you may have to inculcate some aha moments before this one makes sense. Be careful. That's all that means. And how do you and I read it? Well, if, you're, if your neighbor who hears you chanting every day comes over and go, what is that that you do? And you open your conversation with, well, we have this inherent aspect of all living beings in the ten realms, and uh, um, this has existed since time without beginning, and you can you can experience that today. 
they might see little birdies flying around your head as their eyes glaze and they go, oh, that's what you do. I'll see you later. Have a nice day. <laughs> okay. People need baby steps, right? This is why so many times we are urged uh, in our practice to simply get somebody to chant with you. That in itself is breaking some major ice. Uh, I recently had some people who were studied in seminary come to the, the Kuhn here. And they wanted to find out because part of their study in seminary is finding out about other world religions. And I know, I know, Buddhism is not a religion. But religionists view everything as a religion, right? Right? If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> right? So, uh, I invited, I, I said, sure, come on over, we'll talk. And while they were here, I sat in front of my butsudan with it open, just as it is. And I spoke to them in very worldly terms, you know, just as friends talking about, oh, you know, Buddha isn't a person. That's the first one that people struggle with. No, 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 we don't worship or idolize or deify Shakyamuni. Uh, we don't have a, a god. Buddha is a mind state. It's a perceptive state. What? That may be the only lesson they need to learn. That makes a huge impact. Just that. But sooner or later in our dialogue, and I'll entertain people for an hour, two hours, three hours, depending on how engaged they are, they'll let me know when they want to leave. Finally, and I, I keep introducing, what questions do you have? What may I answer for you? And, uh, well, can we see you? And they look right at the mandala. Can we see what you do when you do it? What What is that? I said, well, I'm certainly willing to do that for you. I understand it's part of your study. And uh, I have only one small request, if you'll indulge me, and I, and I will gladly do it. Uh, and I give them a pronunciation card. I show them how to say it. And this was a husband and wife team, so she was showing her husband, look, look, this is how you say it. And he was like, yeah, 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 right? Husband and wife. It's entertaining. <laughs> And uh, I said, if you will, just try. I will do it nice and slow. Namu myo ho denge kyo namu myo ho. Oh, okay, so they're already ready. Okay, there's a rhythm. Oh, that's how I say it. I said, if you'll just try while I'm, I'll just do it for a few minutes. And um, if you'll join me, if you'll please join me and just try to stay with the rhythm and say it with me. I'll, I'll gladly do it for you so you can see how it works. Oh, okay, sure, okay. Oh, this will be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I come up here and I ring the bell and I do my nods and, and then I start. And in the background I hear, nam <laughs> I hear them and I just overwhelmed that connection. I'm, I'm setting them free. Now they're teaching themselves. Now they're experiencing something they will never experience otherwise. It took two hours, but now's where the real teaching happens. Yeah, Buddha doesn't mean person. Yeah, there's no deities. Yeah, we don't worship any. Blah, blah, blah. That's all data. But when I get them to try, and actually, and I'll keep chanting until I hear a good solid, Namu myo ho renge kyo. Oh, they got it. They're doing it. Now we're done. That's their first step. Where they go from there, is largely up to them. I'm here.
anytime you want to call me. Here's the card. Here's the pronunciation. Here's what it means. Here's my web address. Here's my email. Here's. Let me know when you need any more information. I'm here. I'm willing. I'm more than willing. I'm obliged to. But I heard them chant. They're on their way. I have to have that kind of confidence in Buddha. Right? Sowing the seeds. All right. Um, I think, yeah, that was a long enough video for today. I didn't get as far as I would have liked to. But we're hitting, and see, this is exactly what I mean. In these documents, and especially this one, because there's such a word fetish in this one, you know, of, of dissecting the words. What they are, rather than dis dissecting the words themselves, is their pointers to different concepts in the teachings. And so that's quite effective. That lends an, an interesting uh, component to our study. Is that we're not just studying to understand what does this sentence say. But what does this collection of expedient means, of dialogue, of words, what is it intended to awaken, to, to spark curiosity, to actually mean what is the me and the meaning meaning is a word that comes quite often in this document and in buddhist teachings as i said the other day you know shakyamuni himself was almost castigating a, a monk who kept asking the same thing in different structures different words kind of piecemealing everything that shakyamuni said to him he said, look, you have to stop being so attached to the words. That's not where the answer is. And before, and I know some of you are asking, yeah, well, namo myo renge kyo are words. But no, they're not. Once again, that's because of attachment to words. It's what is meant by the words. That is everything. So we don't chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo because they're magic words. We are invoking something, some mental perceptive reality. We are awakening the mind of Buddha with the concepts of Na and Mu and Myo and Ho and Ren and Ge and Kyo. We've covered those words. Nichiren covers those words ad nauseum. This is the Myo. No, this is the Myo. No, this is the Myo. So when we chant, we chant conceptually. Invoke single-mindedly my Buddha. Right? All right. With that, Tremendous, tremendous appreciation for you guys. My patrons, your financial support. All of us owe you a great debt of gratitude. All of you who are liking, subscribing, sharing these videos, sharing the website, threefoldlotus.com, sharing the bookstore at lulu.com slash spotlight slash quoon. All those links are in these videos. We're doing the work. You're being a bodhisattva. How amazing is that? I can't describe my appreciation or my admiration. I'm so proud that you've chosen this path. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Take care of your health. Be mindful which means take care of your health and practice, keep practicing. Be kind. Just be kind to yourself, to your environs. We all deserve it. We all deserve a little relief. 
<laughs> okay. And uh, I will see you in the next one, undoubtedly. Don't forget to download the podcast, too. Those are really helpful. Take care. Bye.